Hey, good morning. So it's go time. That's the name of our series. I'm not challenging you to a fight. It's go time. It's, it's the idea that God is a God of go. He says it a lot. And he does it a lot. There's about 1,300 times in the Bible that we find the word go. Sometimes, it's, many of the times, it's an example of somebody doing that. A lot of times, it's an imperative where he asks us to go. Well, why would he ask us to do that? I think it's because we have a tendency to get stuck in our journey in life, especially in our faith journey. We have a tendency to get stuck. And when you follow Jesus, and even that itself shows that the idea that there's movement, that there's motion, that there's steps and next steps involved with following Jesus. As you do that, you move forward in your story. You move forward in your journey. And what God, when God says go, a lot of times what you'll find out is he often doesn't ask you to stay where you are. And oftentimes, most of the time, if not all the time, you do not stay who you are. You're being transformed and growing day by day as he shapes and molds you to be the person he created you to be. God is a God of go. And I believe if we listen to God's go, we're going to know him better, we're going to develop a deeper faith, and we're going to discover the purposes God has for our life. So I think there's a lot on the line for you to discover what God's go looks like for you. Last week we talked about the idea that we need to go first in two ways. One, Jesus needs to be our go-to for life. We all have go-tos in life. We have go-to orders at restaurants. I pulled up that Chick-fil-A yesterday, and the guy said, I bet you're having a number one with a large unsweet tea, because he was here last week. I was like, wow, you just read my mind. That's crazy. No, he was listening last week. I have a go-to order at a restaurant. We learned last week we have go-to flavors in Gatorade, right? Some people got it right and said great. Some people got it wrong and said blue. Blue is not a flavor. Like, like, we have go-tos, though. Like, it's our go-to in life. And if Jesus is not your go-to for life, you will go to places that cannot deliver and actually shape you to become more like that instead of being more like Jesus. Jesus needs to be your go-to. That's who you need to go to first. But also, what we talked about is a leadership principle. Sometimes all it takes is for someone to go first for others to follow. Sometimes all it takes is someone to go first for others to follow. And this week, what we're going to talk about is another part of go, a way that God wired you and created you. I know this is God's purpose for you, and it's to go together. There, there's this quote. I don't know who actually originally said it. I've seen different names attributed to it. I've seen an African proverb. I've heard different motivational speakers attributed to this quote. Since we don't know that, we're just going to say this was Slappy McGillicuddy. And he said this, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Like, if you want to go fast, go alone, right? See any family vacation. If you want to go fast, go alone, right? But if we've experienced this too. If you want to go far in life, go together. As independent as we want to be, we cannot do life alone. That is not a design flaw from our creator. That is an intentional design for our benefit and the benefit of others. It's a design enhancement of how God wired you. You were created to do life to get together. We were created for a community. So why is it that we both crave it, but we fear it? That, that's most of us. We crave it, we desire connection, but we fear it. We kind of hide and shrink back. Probably because we've had bad experiences of together. For some of us, it might be, you might say, well, I'm an introvert. Well, I'm an introvert. As a matter of fact, I like to think that Jesus was an introvert. I mean, there was one time in his life where he was by himself in the wilderness for 40 days. Now, that's taking introversion to a whole nother level, right? 40 days of nobody around. And somewhere, some people are smiling, going, that would be awesome. <laughs> it, it, we read also when Jesus often got up alone by himself to pray and connect with his heavenly father. It, I, like, it was a daily habit. And when the disciples came and found him and said, hey, the crowds are looking for you. He said, let's go somewhere else. Classic introvert. One time, he's on a boat with his disciples, and as they're upstairs, and they're tending the sails, and they're cutting up at Peter's stories, and all of a sudden a storm's coming, and they're tending the storm. Jesus is down below taking a nap. Classic introvert. There's a party upstairs, and I'm napping downstairs and loving it. But here's the thing. Jesus came back from that 40 days alone, 
And he grabbed his disciples together. So he finds some others. And then he says, let's go to a wedding. And it was a raucous, crowded party. So much so that they ran out of wine. Like it was a crazy party. He, he came back from praying alone with his father in the morning and say, hey, let's go, let's go spend some time together, together with the disciples. He came back from that boat ride where he's down below and eventually he goes up and he teaches the disciples something. And then he says, let's go find a crowd and teach them. Like he was an introvert. He knew the value of alone, but more so he knew the value of together. You were created for togetherness. Here's some wisdom from ancient days that has relevance for current days and it's important to every day. Solomon wrote this in Ecclesiastes. Two are better than one. Two are better than one. You might go, I don't know about that. It's not true with speeding tickets. <laughs> like some things that, sometimes that's not true. Okay, two people are better than one. And he gives some examples. They have a good return for their labor. Like if you have to mow the lawn, if you've got a job to do, two people working on it is a lot more effective than one. And some of you are already pushing back, going, it depends who the other person is, right? Like sometimes I think it'd be better. I'd go quicker if I could get this alone. You can go fast, but you can't go far alone. Um, then he says this, if, they fall, if you fall, either one falls down, one can help the other up. If you've ever been in need, after you Googled and figured out, can I manage this by myself? You eventually probably reached out to somebody and it was hard for you to do, but you go, I need help. And he says this, pity anyone who falls down, or in the Mr. T, Mr. T translation, I pity the fool who, who falls down and has no one to help them up. We don't want anyone at Live Oak to fall down in life and be alone. We want people connected. Life is better connected. That's why we talk about small groups and community so much. Everybody needs to be connected to somebody because at some point, you're going to fall down. And you need someone, sometimes to help you up, or someone just to say, I'm with you. But people to help you up, people aren't just utilitarian. They're not just a, a tool to help you. You were created for engagement and community every day, not just on the tough days. It talks here, if two lie down, they can help keep warm. We have heaters now, so that's not as much of an issue. But how can we keep warm alone? We have heaters and electric blankets. Though one may be overpowered. Now he's talking about a fight. Two can defend themselves. If someone's coming at you in a fight, two is better than one. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. If you have one cord, and you pull on it, it might break. But three wrapped together is a lot stronger. Together is better than alone. That is how you were designed, and that is not a design flaw. In Psalm 133, there's a section of the Psalms called the Psalms, excuse me, the Songs of Ascent. And these are songs that they would re sing and, 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 and yeah, sing as they would go to Jerusalem for these religious festivals. They had this rhythm, this schedule set up where they would go and they'd go to Jerusalem and they would worship and it was kind of just helped them grounded in their faith. Well, they had a playlist of songs that they would sing as they were traveling. In my day, gosh, that makes me sound old. I'm turning 50 this year, so I feel like I'm gonna start singing that and get off my lawn a lot more. But in my day, it was a mixtape. We didn't have playlists. It wasn't drag and drop. It wasn't just hit a click. It was you had to get play and record and get it off the radio at just the right time. And then you had to take it and then there was dual cassette recorders and you could take it and put it on and you can make, create this mixtape of all your greatest hits. And they, on their mixtape, on their playlist as they were traveling to worship, they would sing these psalms and one of them was about together. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Then it goes on, it talks about it's better than oil running down Aaron's beard and dew on Mount Hermon. That's kind of lost on us. It meant a lot to them. I've never said, yeah, what do you want to do tonight? I don't know, I'd like to pour oil on my head and let it run down my beard. Like that doesn't mean anything to me. Or where's Mount Hermon and what's the, with the dew? Well, it was refreshment on Mount Hermon and that's a place that usually didn't get it. There was something that they got. Aaron was this priest. He was Moses' brother. When he was anointed for something sacred, they poured oil on his head and it ran down, meaning he was set apart for God's service. It was sacred, it was holy. And that's what he said, that's what it exactly is. When you're living together in unity with others, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. Life at his best happens together in unity. And it's a place that's blessed. Now, it says good and pleasant. There are some things in life that are good, but they're not pleasant. 
I've got to go to the dentist in a week and a half. And I'm having to mentally gear up for that. I have a fear of the dentist. Like I have to often apologize to my dental hygienist or the dentist and just say, I'm so sorry. It's me. It's not you. I'm a terrible patient. I'm so sorry. I've got a terrible gag reflex, low tolerance for pain, and high anxiety. This is not going to go well for either of us. I'm so sorry. (laughs) But I do it because it's good for me. It's good for me. It's good. But it's not pleasant (laughs) for anyone involved. Some things in life are pleasant, but they're not good. Like, say candy, sweet, stuff like that, which is probably the reason I have to go to the dentist because I didn't have limits on that when I was younger. And so, yeah, that's, that's pleasant, but it's not good for me. It sure feels like it is at first, but in the long run, it's not. This is both good for me and pleasant, good experience. Togetherness is good for you and a great experience. And it's blessed. We, we talked about it. We did a series called Blessed years ago about blessed, what, what one translation that could be, it, it, it's to your advantage. It's favored. It's, it's God-empowered favor. It's to your advantage to experience unity and togetherness in all your relationships. And anywhere you would have a few people together. Together is better than apart. It's good for you. It's pleasant. It's a good experience. It, it's blessed. God bestows life, his blessing, even life evermore. Like that's where life works best. So much so that Jesus, who created us this way, prayed and talked about this a lot. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 17. And there, what you would find is the longest recorded prayer by Jesus. It's the longest recorded prayer by Jesus. But he's not just praying, he's multitasking. We read from this gospel and the gospel of Luke that his disciples are there listening. They're not just learning how to pray from hearing him pray. They're learning about what he values and what's important. And as he prays this long prayer and they're listening, he says this, John 17, 11. He's praying to his heavenly father right before he, he's betrayed and goes to the cross. And he prays this. These were his last prayers, recorded prayers. I will remain in the world no longer. But they, disciples, are still in the world. They're still here. And I'm coming, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name, the name you gave me, so that there's a purpose that why they're in the world and why he's praying, so that they may be one as we are one. They are in the world. They're living in a world where it's hard. Life is hard. Following Jesus can be hard. And he says, I want you to help them by the power of your name, by the power of Jesus' name, help them be one with the kind of unity that the Heavenly Father, the Trinity, three in one, experiences. That kind of unity. Can those disciples experience that? Here's the truth for you. You're in the world too. And life is hard. And life as a follower of Jesus can be hard. And the best way to navigate that is to do it together in unity. He goes on to say this in verse 14. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. The disciples learned this thing from Jesus to say, hey, this may feel like home. Where's home for you? Oh, Galilee, where's home for you? Jerusalem, where's home for you? Capernaum, oh, okay, no, no. That's not home. That's where you were born. That's where you lived. That's your Monday morning mission field where you show up and you follow Jesus and you're his ambassador. But you're not of this world. That's not home for you. Heaven is your home. Life in Jesus is your home. You're just a passerby here, and you're here on a mission. We talked about that in the first week of It's Go Time. You're part of God's great go. And wherever you show up on a regular basis there, you're there on a mission representing Jesus. But that's not your home. You're not of the world. And whenever we get that confused, we start to look more like the world and less like Jesus. And he prayed that they would know that. And here's why. He goes on to say, pray this. As you sent me into the world, God's great go, I have sent them into the world. You're on a mission. You're sent into the world. And he uses these three phrases. You're in the world. It's true for you too. You're not of the world. That's hopefully true for you too. And you are sent into the world. I'm praying you discover that. That wherever you show up, your family, your work, 
your school, your team, wherever it is you show up, your friends, your neighborhood, you are there on a mission to help people understand that there's a God that loves them. And Jesus is the key to life. And the only way it'll be effective is if you do that together. You weren't just created to do life together. You were created to be on mission for God together. And that's where you experience life. That's where faith grows. That's where you know God better. And that is your purpose in life. He goes on and continues his praying. And did you know Jesus actually prayed for you? Like he didn't pray for you by name. But he prayed for you and me. Because he prays for those who would believe in him through the disciples' message. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's you. And he says this. My prayer is not for them alone, the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. That all of them, all, anyone who follows Jesus from that point on, may be one. It wasn't just important for the disciples. It's important for any disciple at any time in history. Oneness, togetherness matters. With the same kind of one, oneness. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. As the Trinity is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he wants that kind of oneness with those you're following Jesus with together. Following Jesus is a team sport. May they also be in us. May they be together in a togetherness that's empowered by God so that, here's why, the world may believe that you have sent me. There's something about the togetherness that we experience together that when it's working right, people see, wow, Jesus is for real. What happens if it's not working right? People look at our faith and think, what a bunch of baloney. What a fraud. Togetherness will either be something that draws people together or to, to Christ or a lack of togetherness will repel them. So if you look at your relationships with other believers, ask yourself, are we together in such a way that, that God can use that to draw people to himself? You don't do that. He empowers that. But your part is to own the togetherness, the unity piece. He goes on and prays this, praying for you. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one. He's saying that again, just in case you missed it, as he's not just praying, but we're listening, eavesdropping, just like the disciples this is what's important to him. That we may be one as he and his heavenly father and the Holy Spirit are one. I and them and you and me. So that, and again, here's the idea. That we could be brought to complete unity. So that, the ripple effect of that, the impact that togetherness has is this. Then the world will know two things. That you have sent me, that God sent Jesus, that he's for real. And that have, you have loved them even as you have loved me, that the love the Father had for the Son, that God's pure love is for real. How do they know what that looks like? How we love one another. How we fight for each other, not fight with each other. How we see that we have God-empowered unity where he's at the center of it. You know one of the best way to succeed in any relationship? Put Jesus at the center of it. He created you for relationship. And it's not a design flaw. It's a design enhancement. It's a perk. It's a benefit. But it's a design. It's a requirement. Your relationships work best when Jesus is at the center of it. And we are sent into the world, part of God's great go, by Jesus, but we're sent together. And how we live together and how we love together makes a statement to the world. So one thing to do is to back up any relationship you have with other believers and ask yourself this question. What statement does our relationship make to the world about who God is? And if there's a lack of unity, again, bring Jesus into it. Pray about it. Consult, consult scripture about it. Talk about it. Work through it. And next week we're going to talk about what do we do when together doesn't work? Because that's going to happen. And Jesus talks about that a lot. And there's a part of our go in that that really makes a difference. So Jesus told his disciples to go and they went. And a lot of people believed. So much so that it caused concern in the Roman Empire. It's amazing that they were threatened by some, a, a group of people that weren't armed. I mean, Rome had a high success rate. And usually because their army was better than the other army, 
with Christians, they weren't sure what to do with them because they weren't armed. They weren't sure what to do with them. But they were threatened by them. Because a lot of people were following Jesus and they didn't know what to do and they thought they put an end to that problem when they crucified him. But it turns out, they thought it just emboldened the followers, but really, the whole, Jesus died. He came back from the dead, and then that same power that rose Jesus from the dead empowered the Christ followers to go, and it empowered, he empowered the Christ followers to do life together, and that togetherness drew people because there was nothing like it in the world. And so Rome greatly started persecuting the Christians. And the book of Hebrews in the New Testament is a letter written to Christ followers who were experiencing great persecution. And when you read Hebrews, it's interesting that, that the, the writer of Hebrews uses a lot of pronouns that are we and us, not you and I. He understands that if you're going to navigate life and difficulty and persecution, if you're just going to follow Jesus, it's got to be together. And he writes this in Hebrews chapter 10. Let us... I pay attention to pronouns. Like, if someone says we, man, that, that means something. If someone says you, that also says something. But here, let us, together, hold unswervingly, like keep following Jesus. That's our goal, to go and follow Jesus. To the hope we profess, that we talk about, that we say we have. For he, God, who promised is faithful. But your relationship in life isn't just about you and God. It's also about you and God and you and others. Love God, love people. Togetherness with each other matters. Let us, together, consider how we, together, may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging. Encouraging means to infuse courage. Encouraging doesn't mean, hey, you look nice today. Encouraging means I want to say something that emboldens and empowers your faith, that gives you courage to move forward encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. There's something about what we do together that's critically important to our faith, spurring one another on toward love and good deeds, encouraging each other to keep following Jesus, to keep professing, to keep going, and we need each other to do that. And it says that some are, are, are in the habit of doing, a lot of times people will read that, with the context of a setting like this. In America, church attendance is down. And it's not that people, less people are going to church, they're just going less frequently. Schedules are very full, so they're attending less frequently. And sometimes people will say this verse, no, it says, let us not giving up meeting together. I believe a setting like this has great value, but I will, I mean, it's important. It's important. But, but here's the thing. What's more important to your faith is gathering in a setting where you can be known like in here, I can talk about this and say, hey, well, what do you think? And 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 by the time we're working around the room, we've been here all day, there's no interaction. It's a sit and listen. And sometimes I inflict things on you that you'd rather not sit and listen to. I get it. Some of you get a good nap, though, so there's that. But, but the idea that a setting like this is limited, I and mean, it's powerful. Jesus talked to crowd, uh, thousands of people and was effective. I know Jesus, but even then, the disciples who were followers of Jesus talked to a crowd is very impactful. But when you look at the followers of Jesus, Acts chapter 2, their secret sauce was they met in homes together. Every day they were connecting. They were spurring one another on. You've got to be known by somebody. Not just to help you up when you fall down, but to help you take next steps in following Jesus. To help you grow in your faith. It matters. And you've got to find your few. I, we just met with small group leaders. I, I did for the first 20 minutes. And so like it was critical that I got a text to say, hey, we're on the last song. So we didn't have a really long meet and greet. You're welcome, introverts. We tried to keep it short. But... But uh, we were talking to small group leaders, and I'll tell you, I, I, I gave them this verse. And it's the same verse I shared with all our small group leaders and actually all of our kids' ministry workers and all of our student ministry, high school and, and, and middle school workers and all of our college leaders. Like, this is, a lot, this is a verse for us as a church this year at Live Oak. If we can get this, what this next verse says right, if we can get this right, I think it will spur you on to love and good deeds. I think it will help us do our mission of making more stronger followers of Jesus Christ. I think it will make a difference like nothing else can if we can get this right. 
And here's this verse that's our, it's a, it's a verse for the year for us in leadership and really for anybody at Live Oak. And it's Proverbs 27, 23. Be sure to know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. This isn't a verse for farmers and ranchers and shepherds. It's not about this. This isn't about livestock. But Jesus often did refer, did refer to us as sheep. And we are followers. We follow the crowd. But really this is a, tension of a, 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 a verse that says, pay attention to your people. Know your people. The way we say it is, be sure you know the condition of your few. Give careful attention to your few. And what we told our, our elementary school and, and, and preschool small group leaders, what we told our middle school small group leaders, our high school small group leaders, our college small group leaders, just a minute ago I told our adult small group leaders, there's a large group of them gathered for training. What we told them is like, if you can find your few, if you can find your few and you can know them and then give careful attention to them, it'll be a game changer for them because everybody needs to be known. Everybody has a next step, but they don't always know what it is or how to take it. Everybody at some point is going to fall down, and they need someone there to pick them up. I believe prayer is very powerful and effective. Everybody needs to be prayed for specifically by name with their specific situations. It's hard for me to do that for everybody. But I'm a small group leader, and I do it for my few. I pray every a day for certain people in my small group. And I pray for them by name. And if I don't know how to pray for them, I go back to this. Well, I need to know their condition. I need to know them. And I need to pay careful attention to them. Hey, tell me what's going on in life. What are your struggles? What are your victories? What are your hopes? Where are you in life? What's going on? Where are you on a Monday? How's things going with your family? We want everyone to be somebody's few. Sometimes that happens when you step up to serve. We're trying to really institute this thing called coaches. We call them E2s, equip and encourage. That if you're serving, somebody can know you and not just know if you're here to serve and know when to serve, but they know what's going on in your life. The best way it happens usually is through small groups. We want everybody on somebody's radar where they're being prayed for every week and someone's getting to know them and they're knowing how to pray and how to encourage and how to help them take their next step, how to equip them to move them into God's great story and his mission in the world. I want you to be known. I want you to be someone's few. Or for some of you, I want you to find your few. Maybe be a small group leader or be a coach who encourages small group leaders. We want this for everybody at Live Oak. We want everybody to find their few. That can happen organically. You can gather, gather a few people and say, hey, we're just going to help each other as we follow Jesus together. Following Jesus is a team sport. For some of you, we have a very specific way you can do that. We have small groups at Live Oak. They launch on September 8th. And we will have as many, we won't let them get to be large groups, but we'll fill up the groups we have. And when they run out, we'll start praying that God provides other small group leaders. They usually show up at the right time. But we ask our small group leaders, they're being trained right now, how do you know your few and give careful attention to your few? Well, groups start on September 8th. You can sign up uh, on the app or the website. Or, the, or a connection card that's in the seat back pocket in front of you, or if you're in the front row, it's down on the floor. But let us know you want to be in a group, and we'll find a group that maybe fits what you're looking for. But we want everyone to find their few. And your next step might be to say, I'm going to get in a group. And the honest thing is, is I've been in groups, and at times, it just didn't work. Chemistry, some life circumstances, it just didn't work. But the reason I keep getting back in groups and believing the power of groups is I've been in groups where it did. And my first experience with a small group that worked right was in college when a man named Ron uh, took an interest in some college guys and he just invested in us. And we met weekly and we studied through the book of Ephesians and we studied through the book of James. We studied it. It's how one of the ways I first learned how to study the Bible. It's one of the ways I first learned my identity in Christ. But the thing that Ron did so well is he didn't treat it like a class to teach. He taught us like people to know, and to love, and to challenge, and to walk through. And he helped me take my next steps in life. And he helped Tim do that, and Ty do that, and Troy do that. We did that. And we were doing life together. And it was just something, it was the most, first time I experienced this catalytic experience of life change like never before. It all happened in a small group experience. And what Ron did really well is he got to know us. There was one-on-one -on -one time. 
There were lunches. There were coffees. There were, there were, there were messages like, hey, how's it going? And I knew he was praying for me regularly because he would say, hey, you know, you were talking about this. I've been praying about that. How's it going? It was an amazing experience for me. I want that kind of experience for everybody. I want that for you. And I really think that's God's great go for you is to find your few. And it's not always easy. And the thing I know about most of us is we crave it, but we fear it. And sometimes we fear it because we tried it and it didn't go so well. And we said, that's enough for me. Sign me up for that 40 days alone in the wilderness. It didn't always go well for Jesus' few either. It was bumpy. But in the end, Jesus prayed for togetherness for his people. You might be the answer to Jesus' prayer of living life together in unity and togetherness. And that is good for you. It is pleasant. It's good to experience. It is blessed. God is right in the middle of that. And he empowers something that's beyond what we could do on our own. But what I also know about you is you were created with this need for that. And as much as you fear it, I know that you need it. So I want to challenge you to go and find your few. And next week we're going to talk about what happens when you find your few and you wish you hadn't. <laughs> What do you do when you find your few and it's not going well? What do you do when together isn't happening? And I think it'll be effective because there's a go there that's involved for us too that's critical if we're going to experience this. Let's stand for closing prayer. Again, if you're not a part of a small group and you want to be, sign up on the Live Oak or, uh, website or app under sign up links uh, and let us know and we'll help you find a group. And if you feel like I want to help shepherd and care for a few as a small group leader, come see me. Come let us know that because we're always looking for people who are willing to step forward and lead a group or lead a team here at Live Oak or encourage and shepherd and coach a few leaders because we believe it's possible as we grow larger to keep growing smaller where everybody can be known, cared for, and given careful attention to the way it talks about in that verse. God, thanks that you designed us with this need for community. Uh, sometimes we'll settle for just having some buddies or friends or pals. Um, but you called us to more because you know that we need that. You designed us that way, and it's not a design flaw. It was very intentional, not just for what it does for us, which is good and pleasant and blessed, but it's also powerful, uh, a powerful message to the world that you are for real and your love is for real, and you love them because they can see what love looks like as it has skin on and it's lived out in front of them. God, I pray that you would help us be good at helping everybody find their few. We have a long way to go, but with you, all things are possible, and we trust you in that. Help us all to go and find our few and to know them and give careful attention to them well. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for being here. If you'd like to talk, I'll be down at the front.